terminology though, and I wrote my thesis on rhythm and timing in Hong Kong English, so that's what I did um, while I was out there, um, and I was at the University of Reading, registered there for that. I also acquired a husband, <laughs> he's British, which was very nice, and I sang in local rock bands, and just to prove that I did sing in local rock bands, oh, and I left in 2001, that's when I took up my job in Reading. This is one of my bands. <laughs> Do that, and it's more feminine, it just sounds more feminine. Do Japanese men? 
expressions, which I thought were great. This one was good. Paint on air. <laughs> that was one of my favourites. So instead of saying, uh, well, you'd go, paint on air, and then you'd, you'd say something. So that was a filler. Also, this was my favourite. Uso! <laughs> okay, which means, no, really? Yes, truly, that kind of thing. So that was good. You can have a whole conversation just by saying, Uso!
two languages behave rather differently when borrowing English words, which I thought was rather interesting, considering you could actually have similar things at the ends of the words. Why don't, why don't these languages behave the same way? But, I mean, as we've said before, McDonald sounds like Macadonadadol in Japanese, or Macadonadadol, I think was the advert. But in Cantonese, it sounds like Madonna. So, is this McDonald's or is it Madonna? <laughs> so when I asked a student um, what their favourite thing was, the student said Madonna, and I thought he was talking about Madonna, but he wasn't, he was talking about McDonald's, but in, in Cantonese it's a different strategy. So why is this happening? Well, Japanese retains as many consonants as possible, although in McDonald's it hasn't retained the Z sound at the end, but it's retained most of them, and it inserts vowels in order to deal with the fact that a consonant is there. But in Cantonese, it tends to retain the number of syllables. So Madonna has the same number of syllables as McDonald's, but instead of keeping the consonants, it kind of loses them. So at the end of the word, you get Madonna with no L or D or Z. They've all gone. There are reasons for that. I won't go into this here, but um, if anyone is really interested, I can point you in the direction of places where you can see why this happens. Now, according to Jennifer Jenkins, which ca who came on um, Monday, this means that English spoken by Cantonese speakers is likely to be more difficult to understand than the English spoken by Japanese speakers. But remember, she was talking about an international context. I think if you're faced with a Japanese speaker and a Cantonese speaker, and you're a native speaker of English and you're not used to it, then both of them might be equally difficult to understand for different reasons, because Japanese puts in the vowels, but Cantonese loses the consonants. So, uh, but this would be Jennifer Jenkins' view uh, based on her data. Okay, another difference is aspiration. Cantonese speakers don't have any difficulty aspirating initial voices closest because the same thing happens in Cantonese. You have a p and a fa. The same kind of thing happens. The Japanese speakers need to learn this. They have to learn how to do aspiration more effectively because it's not quite as obvious in Japanese. Okay, here's an example. Um, Japanese pajama, which is the thing you wear in bed, okay, top and bottoms, pajama was heard as backgammon by a friend of mine. I don't know what the context was. I'll stay overnight and bring my backgammon, or bring my pajamas, I think, pajama, whatever. It was heard as, as backgammon by um, a friend of mine. And aspiration has a role to play here, because if you're not aspirating the p in pajama, or if you're not making a silent vowel or something, then, um, then it's heard as something different. So the initial p is heard as a verb due to lack of aspiration. If this is stressed, and it's a different stress to English, but if the Japanese person had said my pajamas, then they would have understood, okay? In fact, this doesn't receive much aspiration in English because the stress is pajamas, pajamas, so the stress happens different. So there's more than one thing going on here, but that's impossible. So the pitch features had altered the way the stress sounded. Something else which is different, Japanese speakers have a problem with la and ra, but Cantonese speakers have a problem with la and na. So we used to think up all different kinds of ways to get Cantonese speakers to produce the l's and the n's, and the, the most
Cantonese is something like four hour. Okay? So there's no linking at all. You don't get any linking in this position in Japanese. There may be a proper stop, there may not be. But in Cantonese, you, you get quite a strong proper stop at the beginning of a word like this. So there's no linking whatsoever across word boundaries in that position in, in, um, in Japanese or Cantonese. Um, with dark L, Cantonese speakers use a vowel instead of a dark L sound. And we've already heard from Professor Wells that actually quite a lot of English speakers do this. So uh, they'll say bottle instead of bottle, for example. So that's what a, a Cantonese speaker will do. They'll say apple instead of apple. But you can understand that. It's a common feature. Japanese inserts a vowel after the L type consonant. I can't think of any exceptions. I'm sure you may be able to, but I can't think of any. So in the previous example, did that. And also school is likely to be something like skuru, or skuru maybe with a long vowel in Japanese, so we get the bu sound at the end. And uh, in Cantonese it sounds like school, school, go to school, and the L has completely disappeared, and because it's already very rounded and close, there's no attempt to make a, a different kind of vowel sound out of it, so that's what it sounds like. Interestingly, there was a place um, I used to go to in in uh, Kekinan, which was a bar, I should write this up. Um, the, the romanization of it was okay, that was the romanization of the name of this bar. Okay, can anybody guess what the name of this bar was? How's it spelt in English, do you think, or another language? Okay, now for a long time we thought that it was ruble, ruble, which is a which is a, a Russian coin. Okay, we thought it was ruble for a long time, but we found out when eventually we got some heavy note paper from the place that it's not actually ruble at all. It was this. It was this French place. It was named after a museum. It was Louvre. But in Japanese, they're both the same. So to me, it's uh, okay, but there's no verse sound in Japanese. So the two things sound exactly the same. Um, in the Japanese phoneme group, the variant preceding the vowel E is realized as so she and C is a potential problem for Japanese speakers because if it's an E vowel, it becomes a kind of consonant. So this can be a difficulty for Japanese speakers. But interestingly, in Cantonese, the variant of preceding the vowel U is realized as something like sh. I'm not quite sure phonetically what it was. I never sat down and listened to it that hard. So shu and su is a problem. But C and she is not a problem for Cantonese speakers. So we've got palatalization happening, but it happens before different vowels. And I thought that was fascinating. Why would it happen that way? It just seemed so strange that one language should palatalize before a palatal type vowel looks front, and the other vowel should palatalize, uh, the other sound should palatalize before a vowel that was quite back and not really very palatal. So that fascinated me. My friend Sue wasn't very impressed with this because she was always being referred to as shoe, which is something you put on your foot. <laughs> so uh, whenever they, they'd say shoe, she'd say sue, sue, and they'd have to practice saying sue properly and not shoe, but then they'd say, oh, shoe's coming, you know. <laughs> <laughs> okay, Africans are also affected in, in both languages. So, um, well, I guess there's only a ch sort of Africans in English, but in, um, in Cantonese, instead of a ch sound, you get a ts sound if it was before certain vowels. So that was quite, um, quite interesting. Another difference, Cantonese has f, but it doesn't have v. And f is regularly changed to f. And this, again, happens quite commonly in London speech. So instead of saying three, a London will say three, and so on. When I was at school, we had a Cantonese maths teacher, and we used to think that she was from London, because she, she, she instead of saying maths, she said maths, and she also had this dark L, so, um, which was a vowel sound, which is a London feature. So we were convinced she 
she was from London, but she was actually from, uh, from Hong Kong teaching us math. Um, Japanese also doesn't have the as a phoneme. Um, the nearest group is that beginning ha, um, and it's written, there's something in it that's written foo with an F, but it's not really an F, it's more of a bilabial kind of sound. So it's like foo, this sort of sound. And you only get it before a back vowel. So this means that if you have um, this sound before other vowels in English, sometimes Japanese speakers have a her sound, um, which can, can be very wrong indeed. So for example, I had to stop a child saying, I'm ho, I'm ho, because the word means something quite different in English. <laughs> a lady of dubious uh, profession. Okay, so if you say, oh, I'm ho, and you're about this size, you're thinking, how is that possible? Okay, so th this is not a nice thing to say. I want ho. No, you don't want ho, darling. No. <laughs> so this can be a problem with certain words, and it's actually quite different to a fuss sound.
do better in life and earn more money and climb up the social scale. So it's a complete transactional usage of the language. We're not interested in English culture. We don't care about English speaking people. We just want to make money. Okay, so we're going to learn English for that reason. And that seems to, that seems to be a very strong motivation. So you do find that in companies, you get people from Hong Kong learning English in e evening classes at school. The government is trying to make teachers pass, pass a benchmark test in English. So it's very much seen as the language that you need if you want to get on in the world and do business. Although for how much longer this is going to be true in Southeast Asia, this is another question altogether because China is gaining a lot of power and one can imagine that soon if you want to do business with China, you'll need to learn Mandarin Chinese. So at the moment, English is important, but soon it's going to be Mandarin Chinese if you want to make money. So that's a different story. Okay, just a short thing at the end. I learned much of what I know about Cantonese and Japanese. It's a very short lecture. Um, by listening and then reading about it and then listening again. So really using my listening skills a lot. Oh, that's why that happens at the end of that word. Ah, I see. All right. And in my opinion, an informed listener can learn a lot about language. And you are all informed listeners. You've been here on this course or you study phonetics elsewhere. English phonetics, English pronunciation, you know a lot about it. So now, what I want you to go away and do is switch on your ears and get going and listen to what people are doing around you and make an effort to listen and hear what they're up to. Okay? That's all I have to say. But if there are any questions, these are the references that I used um, in my talk. I apologise for the small size of the handout. I was going to put together a text version, but I just didn't have time. I've been really, really busy. So, um, if anyone would like a copy of this, I have some business cards. You can email me, and I can send you the um, I can send you the uh, PowerPoint presentation if you want. So do come and get a card of me. You may feel the need for it. I don't know. Um, or you may want my card just because it looks nice. It's very pretty. <laughs>